Now, while uh, others are just finding a seat, it would be helpful if you have a Bible, if you could turn to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Not very easy to find quickly, so use the index if you'd like to. Paul's letter to the Galatians. I'm continuing the studies in the work of the Holy Spirit, and this morning I want to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in Galatians and see what Paul says about it here. It's one of the key little letters in the New Testament related to our subject. What the Magna Carta is to England and the Declaration of Independence is to the United States, the letter to the Galatians is to Christians. Here is our charter of Christian liberty. And if you want to know what freedom really is, this is the book above all others that you would have to read. Now the word freedom is being widely used today. There are freedom fighters. People are protesting, marching for freedom, and they want everybody to have freedom. But when I talk to people who talk about freedom and ask, what do you mean by it? I get all kinds of answers. President Roosevelt said that real freedom would consist in freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. Well, that's one definition, but you don't often hear that definition today. Some people say we must be free from capitalism, free from imperialism, free from all the other isms that there are. But that's not how this book defines freedom. Paul here is fighting for the liberty of the Christian men. And real freedom consists in two things, and two only. It consists in being free from legalism on the one hand, and from license on the other. Now those are words that are not in normal conversational use, so I'm going to have to explain them. But Paul is saying that if you really want to be free, real liberty consists in being free from legalism and its grip, and the grip of license on the other hand. Now let me tell you what I mean. In the first half of this little letter, he deals with legalism, which means the control of human beings by law, by rules and regulations outside themselves, telling them what to do, making them do certain things, and punishing them if they don't. That is the system of legalism. And every society has found it necessary to have a legal profession and to write laws telling people if you do that you'll be punished for it. And we live under English legalism. There are laws that I've got to keep when I go out in my car. I'm not free to do anything I want. If the view looks nicer on this side of the road, I'm not free to drive that side of the road. I've got to stick to the left. I'm not free to do 60 if I want to in certain areas, and I'm certainly not free to do 80 in any area. I'm under legalism. I'm told what to do. And I stopped at one crossroads in London the other day, and I counted 15 different road signs that I was expected to read before I moved on. <laughs> and behind me were a lot of hooting cars that wondered why I was waiting. And I was expected to read 15 different things telling me which way to go and what to do and where to go. This is legalism. It's not freedom. You are hedged in by rules and regulations. Now religion can get like that. And Paul had lived in a religion that was legalism, a religion that was just full of rules and regulations. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. And it's a miserable kind of religion. It's a hard kind of religion. It becomes more and more oppressive. Paul had been a Pharisee, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a really Jewish Jew, and he knew what it was. Do you know the Jews of Paul's day had 1,281 different rules about Sabbath observance? Couldn't wear a safety pin, couldn't wear your false teeth, couldn't go for a walk more than a thousand paces couldn't drag your stick in the dust or you were plowing. All kinds of petty rules and regulations. That's legalism. And we must be very careful that we never let Christianity become a legalistic religion, a matter of keeping the commandments, a matter of doing this and that according to the rules and regulations. Now, Paul fought against this all his life. There were misguided Christians who wanted to put new converts under a list of rules and regulations, 
Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. And Paul said, you are not going to do that to my converts. I am fighting for their freedom, for their liberty. We're done with the law when we become Christians. Life is no longer a matter of petty rules and regulations and trying to live up to them. That is not how Christianity is. Now to try and help them to see that Christianity is not a matter of keeping rules, he says this in chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 about the Holy Spirit. He says, Oh foolish Galatians, he's talking to his young converts who are beginning to live by rules and regulations. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, put a spell on you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so many things in vain, if it really is in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing of faith? In other words, how did you start the Christian life? I will guarantee this, nobody ever became a Christian by trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Nobody ever became a Christian by trying to do all the things that a Christian is supposed to do. Nobody ever found the power of God by trying desperately to achieve a certain standard of behavior. Nobody ever got to it that way. Paul had once thought that if you want to get through to God, you kept the Ten Commandments. That's what he means by the works of the law. But he came to a point where he realized that that road is more and more frustrating. You get more and more tied up in knots because there are so many regulations, so many commandments, and the one thing that you discover when you try to keep them is the weakness of the flesh. You can't make it. And that's a real problem because you feel more and more guilty. You develop a guilt complex because you're not keeping this rule and you're not keeping that regulation and it snowballs and it builds up until you just feel guilty more and more. Now that's what legalism does to an ordinary man or woman. If you think Christianity is a matter of keeping the rules, of trying to live according to the laws, then you are condemning yourself to <coughs> discovering that the flesh, my nature, is just too weak. Can't keep them. There are too many rules, and I'm just not disciplined enough to get up to the standard. Well, now, Paul here says, how did you discover power? How did you find out that your religion is not something you're meant to carry, but something that's meant to carry you. Did you discover that by trying to keep the law? Or did you discover it as soon as you stopped trying and started trusting and heard with faith? And what he's saying is this, how did you ever know the power of the Holy Spirit? He says, I'll tell you, as soon as you stopped trying and started trusting, as soon as you stopped trying to pick yourself up and let him take over, now, these are the two kinds of religion that you meet in the world. I would call one the rowing boat religion and the other the sailing boat religion. The rowing boat religion is a terrible business. You're pulling for all you're worth trying to get there and you never see God because when you're rowing, your face is usually turned the wrong way. And you can't see where you're going and you keep pulling and you don't know where you're getting to. Maybe you're going round in circles and don't know it. A sailing religion is where you have set the sail of faith and waited for the wind of the Spirit to blow. And it's the wind of the Spirit that's carrying you along. It's the power of the Spirit. If you're in a rowing boat, you'll discover the weakness of the flesh pretty quickly. If you're in a sailing boat, you'll discover the power of the wind. If you are trying to be a Christian, this is precisely what will happen. You'll discover the weakness of the flesh. You can't make it. If you are trusting to be a Christian, you'll discover the power of the Spirit blows you along and carries you along and gets you where you need to go and your eyes facing forward can see your destination. 
Now then, having begun that way, these idiotic Galatians, that's not my phrase, it's Paul's, so I can use it, these idiotic people, having started the Christian life by trusting, were now trying. They were in danger of going back to rules and regulations. Circumcision was the particular one that Paul was worried about. But he said, that's the thin end of the wedge. If you start doing that because it's one of the laws, then you've got to keep the rest. You mustn't roast meat on Sundays and all the rest of it. That's one of the Jewish laws too. And if you once start trying to keep the Ten Commandments, you ought to keep all the others, and you're really sunk. Oh, you foolish Galatians, having started with a religion that carries you, why are you going back to a religion you'll have to carry? Having started by trusting with the hearing of faith, why are you going back to the works of the law? Why are you making it so hard for yourself? And so many Christians do make Christianity hard for themselves by going back to this kind of thing. This is legalism. So Christians must be told you are no longer under the law. It's no longer a matter of obeying rules and regulations. Now at this point, Paul was frequently misunderstood. And whenever I have said this, following Paul, I have been misunderstood. And I'll tell you the misunderstanding. Immediately people say that a Christian is not under rules and regulations. They jump to the conclusion that what the Christian is saying is you can now do what you like. And that is license. And it is not liberty. Let me give you some down-to-earth examples. I'll talk about two areas of Christian living in which Christians have made the mistake of making rules and regulations for themselves. Take Sunday observance. Here is an area of Christian behavior in which our forefathers very often made rules and regulations. Thou shalt not do this on Sunday, thou shalt not do that on Sunday. And Sunday became a legalistic day and therefore an unhappy day, a day in which it was hedged around with restrictions in which you locked certain cupboards and put away certain toys and didn't do this and didn't do that and didn't do the other. And it became sheer legalism. And it's very interesting that those who had that view of the Sunday began to call it the Sabbath, which is a Jewish regulation, not a Christian one. Now then, as soon as you say you are not under legalistic rules and regulations for your Sunday behavior, somebody's going to jump into license and say, good, that means I can do what I like on Sundays. And it doesn't mean anything of the sort. That is license to do what you like. Now let's take another sphere. I am a total abstainer by my principle. And I deliberately choose to be that. But you will never hear me saying that I think every Christian ought to sign the pledge. And I remember being told once a year in the Sunday school in which I was brought up, or I was confronted with a pledge to sign every year in November. And I got the impression that you couldn't possibly be a Christian unless you signed that pledge. Now I don't know if they intended to give me that impression, but I got it. This is not a rule of Christian living that everybody has to be a total abstainer. But as soon as I say that, and I said it a year ago among our young people, some of our own young people here thought that I had said it's perfectly all right for Christians to go on a pub crawl and to drink if they want to. And I had said no such thing. There are some people whose minds are so small that if they can't have legalism, with rules and regulations, they think the only alternative is to do what you like. But what I now want to say is what Paul says in Galatians. And in Galatians 5 and 6, he deals with this opposite error. And it is this, to do what you like is not freedom. It is as much slavery as legalism. In other words, if you reject the rules and regulations and jump over into the opposite extreme and do what you like, that is sheer slavery. Under legalism, you're a slave to other people. Under license, you're a slave to yourself. But either way, you don't know what freedom is. And if you are living a life that does just what you like on Sundays or in relation to drink or anything else, if you do just what you like, 
then frankly you're even worse a slave than a man who's under law. And sooner or later you will find yourself put back under the law, if only to stop you misbehaving. And every man who jumps into the license category will come into trouble with the law sooner or later. Because that way lies anarchy. And I have the feeling that a very great deal of the talk about freedom today is really talk about license, which is not freedom at all. It is fighting for freedom to do what I like, to do what I want, and that is sheer slavery. And so Paul at the end of Galatians is talking about the slavery that comes if you feel free to do what you like, and it becomes a slavery to your own passions and desires, and that's the very worst kind of slavery. Isn't it amazing that those who throw off the shackles of legalism so often voluntarily put their hands in the handcuffs of license and become just as much slaves? I think of a couple of drunk men on the top of a bus going home in Newcastle on Tyne and they were obviously very worried about the reception that they were going to get from their respective spouses at home. And one finally turned to the other and said, well, I'm going to say to her, I'm free, aren't I? I'm free, but he wasn't. He was a poor, besotted slave. He couldn't see through one Saturday night without getting in this condition. He was in the absolute grip of it. Now you see the difference. Here are two forms of slavery. You can either be a slave under the law, legalism, telling you what to do, hedging you about with restrictions, punishing you when you break the law. Or you can be a slave to license and a slave to your own desires and passions and it's just as bad as slavery. What then is the answer? In the second half of Galatians, Paul is dealing with license. Those who know that Christians are free from the commandments, those who know that Christians are not under the law, but who don't know how to use their freedom properly. And so he deals with this by talking of walking in the Spirit. In other words, the real freedom is freedom to do what the Spirit wants you to do. It is not freedom to do what you want to do because that's slavery. The real freedom is neither legalism nor license, but walking by the Spirit. Now, that's background before we read a passage. I'd like to read now from chapter 5. Verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants one of another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you would. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are plain immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now I want to spend the rest of this morning helping you to understand this crucial passage. Because I am set free from the law, I am not free to do as I like. In other words, I am a total abstainer because I am free to be one. Because I choose freely to be one, 
because I want to love my neighbor and I think in my circumstances I can most help those who can't control their drinking by being a total abstainer. But it is a free choice, it is not a rule of the Christian life, it's not something that I'm told to do, it's not something that I must do to be a Christian, it's a complete act of freedom to be such. And you are free not to be such if that is how the Spirit leads you. You are not free to be other than this if it's just the flesh that has told you to be free. Now it is this understanding of freedom which makes a man really no liberty and it's this that I'm going to talk about now. We begin then with the simple fact that in every Christian there is a conflict a conflict which only the Christian has, which nobody else does go through. And therefore I promise anyone here who's not a Christian that if you become a Christian, you will have more conflict than you ever had before. You will lose the peace that you had before because this conflict was not present. What is the conflict? It is the conflict between flesh and spirit. Every Christian is torn two ways. Now let me get it absolutely clear in your minds that by flesh I do not mean body and by spirit I do not mean mind. It's extraordinary how many people think this way. But let me tell you what I do mean. By the word flesh the Bible doesn't just mean this body. It means everything I am by birth. Everything I am by my nature. Whether it's my physical habits and desires or my mental habits and desires or my affections or my ambitions, anything at all that is of me is my flesh. Anything at all that is me by nature is my flesh. And that's what the Bible means. Not just the physical things but the emotional, the affection life, everything that is of me. Everything that I was born with, everything I would be if God had not touched my life. That's what the word flesh means. The word spirit refers to everything I am by being born again. That when I became a Christian, God's Holy Spirit took up residence in my heart and everything he has created within me is spirit. Now then, the conflict between these two is terrible. It really is. At times it's a warfare and a man becomes a civil war. His old nature, what he really is by nature, pulls one way. His new nature pulls another and he feels torn in two. It's a terrible conflict. But one thing is absolutely certain in the conflict and Paul makes it clear. You cannot possibly follow both. Absolutely impossible to do both. Now it is this that Paul is talking about in verses 16 to 18 which very simply say this If you are letting the flesh pull you then the spirit can't If you are letting the spirit pull you the flesh can't And the Christian is the only person in the world who has the choice of letting one or the other take over the leadership That's why Paul says walk after the spirit walk by the spirit What he means is this Every Christian, every moment of every day is confronted with two paths leading in the opposite direction. His old nature is walking down that path. His new nature, filled with the Spirit, is walking up this path. He can either say, well, I'll follow this or that. But the one thing he cannot ever do is do both. And every moment of every day we're either following this path or that but you certainly can't mix them up. And if you're walking in the Spirit this morning, it will be impossible for you to walk after the flesh. And if you're walking after the flesh, it will be impossible for you to respond to the Holy Spirit. It's quite impossible. Now, even the translation that I read puts it a little more softly than Paul does in the original language. Let me read it as he wrote it. I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You won't need to bother about that if you're walking by the Spirit. In other words, if you walk this way, you can forget about that way. If you're walking that way, you will forget about this way. You cannot do both. And this conflict is one of the deepest things that a Christian has to face. 
Well, now, having said that, how do you know which road you're on? How do you know whether a particular action is of the flesh or the spirit? It's one of the most important questions that you could ever ask. Because it's awfully difficult to sort out when the flesh is pulling and when the spirit is pulling. In your early Christian life, you can make a lot of mistakes here. For example, you want a particular job or you want to marry a particular person. And so you say, is it of the flesh or is it of the spirit? Is it my old nature wanting to do this? Or is it my new nature wanting to do this? Is this the old me reasserting itself or is this the new me wanting to do something that's right? And it's awfully difficult to sort out your motives. How do you do it? One way, one way is to see where the roads lead. One way is to see what kind of thing happens down each road. And so Paul now says, I will now describe for you the consequences of going one road or the other. I'll tell you what will appear in your life if you travel this road. I will tell you what will appear if you travel this way. The works of the flesh are these. The fruit of the Spirit are these. In other words, if you go down this road, certain things will inevitably happen. If you go up this road, certain other things will inevitably happen. Now see where these two leaders lead us. First of all, take the works of the flesh. Now I think it's very interesting that he uses the word works and not the word fruit. The word works speaks to me of a factory, of man-made products that don't need God at all. Man can produce works. And so let's see what the factory of the flesh produces, turning out with monotonous regularity certain things. It is a plural word because you won't find all of these things in the same person. You might find one in one and one in another. But sooner or later this kind of thing appears. And this is not a complete list because it says at the end of the list, and the like. It reads like a police desk blotter. Let's look down the list. There are four areas of life in which things will go wrong when you walk after the flesh and follow your old nature. In the realm of sex, in the realm of religion, in the realm of society, and in the realm of drink. And I think nowadays Paul would have added drugs. This is what you can expect to happen if you're following your old nature. These are the consequences. First, in relation to sex, Paul says if you follow your old nature, then sooner or later immorality, impurity and licentiousness will appear. Now those words mean very simply, and I give you the exact meaning, the first word means sex outside marriage. The second word means dirty mindedness. And the third word means to shock public decency. Now, inevitably, if you walk down the road of your old nature, one of those three things will appear in this area of life, and maybe more. You will either do something you deliberately know to be wrong, or you will keep it inside your... You will either do something you deliberately know to be wrong, or you will keep it inside your mind, or you will let it right out and deliberately shock public decency. But that's what happens down that road. Now the second thing he mentions is religion. What happens in religion when you follow your old nature? Two things, idolatry and sorcery. Let me explain those. First of all, your religion will become an outward thing in which you have to see something before you can feel religious. And therefore you will want images or a nice Gothic building or something that will help you to be religious because when you're walking down the road of the flesh you have nothing inside to make you godly so you want more and more outside aids and help and so you want images and idols and things to make you feel religious that's what happens when you're walking the road of your old nature and the other thing is sorcery what does that mean? it means superstition touch wood cross your heart salt over your shoulder walking under ladders though I think there's a sensible reason for that as well as the superstition <laughs> It means playing around with black magic. It means dabbling in spiritism. It means getting interested in the occult. How many people are getting interested in the occult today? Now, Paul is saying 
That's the kind of thing that happens down that road to your religion. It becomes a religion that you want to see things, outward things. It becomes a religion that becomes superstitious and occult. You get interested in dabbling in the weirdies, and that's what happens. And Christians can walk the way of the flesh and get too interested in the occult. Now what happens in your social life? He lists eight things that will appear in your social life. Enmity, which means hatred of people, prejudice against them because of their class or color or something. Strife, which means violence. You'll settle arguments with your fists. You'll intrigue your scheme. Jealousy, that burning destructive attitude to other people which destroys them. Anger, which literally means boiling point. That's the word Paul uses, boiling over in temper. Selfishness, which means to be filled with personal ambition. Dissension, which means to love partisan rivalry and party labels and strife against others. Party spirit, which means to prefer sects and cliques instead of being loving to all. And envy, which means bitter resentment at others who've got more than you have. That's what happens when you walk the way of the flesh. And finally, in relation to drink, Paul says drunkenness is the inevitable outcome of following your lower nature to its logical conclusion. And that will lead to carousing, which is revelry, orgies, debauchery, in which you disgrace yourself as Noah disgraced himself when he got out of the ark. Now here is a list which Paul says is far from complete, but he says that can appear in your life even as a Christian. If you walk after the flesh, that's how you tell. Are you getting more bad-tempered? Are you getting divided from people? Are you getting jealous of others? Do you envy others? Then this is your nature leading you by the nose down that path. And Paul says, sooner or later, if you go down that path of doing what you like, you will find yourself under law again. Because law is precisely to, to stop people damaging others by walking after the flesh. Every English law is designed to prevent the flesh harming another. Why are there highway codes? Why are the laws of the road? Why can't I drive more than 30? Why can't I do this? Why can't I drive on the right-hand side of, of the road if I want to? Precisely for this reason, that it's my flesh that wants to do it and my flesh is going to hurt and injure another if there's no law to stop me. So sooner or later, if you walk the way of the flesh, even if you don't come into trouble with human laws, which is highly likely, you will most certainly run smack into the law of God because there's a law of God that says that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom. In other words, if you think license is freedom, sooner or later you'll run right back into law, either human law or divine law. If you manage to escape human law and do everything your old nature wants to do in this life, then mark my words, I warn you as I warned you before, God's law decrees that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a pretty terrible picture, but that's that way, and you can tell when you're walking that way by these things appearing in your life. Well, then let's now look at the lovely side. Let's suppose that somebody follows the Spirit, the Spirit leads them this way, and they start following the Spirit. Do you know what will appear in their life? Fruit will appear. Now, I love the word fruit, and it's a very important word for this reason. Man produces works, but God produces fruit. No man has ever been able to manufacture fruit, nor never will. The apples we had here last Sunday or the Sunday before, those flowers, but the apples in your garden, you, you couldn't manufacture those. No man has ever manufactured an apple. Only God can produce fruit. Now the word fruit also tells me that you can't have it without the tree and Jesus said unless you abide in the vine, unless you're in touch with me, you can't produce fruit. It tells me also that this fruit doesn't appear overnight and we're not going to be saints tomorrow. Fruit doesn't grow overnight. It grows gradually and steadily. But the most interesting thing about this word fruit is this. The word is in the singular. 
Whereas the works of the flesh are plural, many of them divided among many people. The word fruit here is singular. It all appears together. It's one fruit with nine flavors, and all these nine flavors appear together in the life of someone who's walking after the Spirit. Now, what are the flavors? All nine things will appear. You don't need to cultivate them. You don't need to try and have them. They appear in the life of one who's walking after the Spirit. They grow in the character of one who's walking this way. Three of them put us right with God, three of them put us right with everybody else, and three of them put us right with ourselves. The three towards God are love, joy, and peace. Need I say any more? When you're walking after the Spirit, you love God, you enjoy God, you have peace with God. It's as simple as that. And what about other people that are so awkward and so irritating? When you're walking after the Spirit, you are patient, kind, and good toward them. You don't have to try to be. The fruit will grow. You will be patient. You will be kind. You will be good. And towards yourself, you will be faithful. That means stickability, reliable. That's tremendous to be a reliable person. You will be gentle and meek. And you will be a real gentleman. I don't care whether you eat your peas off a knife or what you do. If you're walking after the Spirit, you will be a gentleman. I mention that because I did have a meal with a chap solidly shoveling peas into his mouth with a knife. But you know, he was one of the finest gentlemen I ever met. Let's not think that being a gentleman is a matter of having certain social etiquette rules for oneself that you've learned in your youth. He was a gentleman. That's why everybody respected him so deeply. Because gentleness is what gives courtesy. And you will furthermore have self-control. Do you know the one thing that strikes me about modern men is that we can control everything but ourselves. We can control space, we can control our environment, we can control everything but ourselves. And a person who's walking after the Spirit will find they have self-control. And now Paul says, and if you walk this road, you will never, never come into trouble with the law, either man's laws or God's laws. Why? Because there never has been a law against any of these things. Against such there is no law. No history reveals that there has ever been a law passed against love. There has never been a law that says thou shalt not enjoy God and life. There has never been a law against peace. There's never been a law against patience, never been a law against kindness or goodness or reliability or gentleness or self-control. You'll never run into the law, either the human law or the divine law. Against such there is no law. Now doesn't this make sense? If you're a Christian, is not this your life? Flesh and spirit tugging you in different directions. You know you can't go both ways. You know perfectly well that when you give in to your old nature and follow that path, this is the kind of thing that appears in your life. You get irritable, you fall out with people, you lose your temper with them, you envy them what they have that you haven't. This is what happens. And you know, or at least I hope you know, that when you walk after the Spirit and let Him give you life, then you are completely free. Free. For I will tell you this, the biggest freedom in the world is to be free from yourself. Isn't that the biggest freedom there is? And isn't that the freedom nobody has? Isn't that the freedom that nobody seems interested in having? I want to be free to do what I want. I want to be free for myself. But the Bible says you'll never be free. That's slavery. You can be free from yourself by being led by the Spirit. You will then be free from the law too because the law won't be able to touch you. There's no law against being free from yourself. That's real freedom. Legalism and license, the two forms of slavery are left behind. You're neither a slave to other people nor a slave to yourself. You are free. You are not free from God. You are free for God. You're not free from your neighbor. You're now free for your neighbor. You're not free from love. You're free for love. That's real freedom. That's why in a very well-known collect in the Book of Common Prayer, it finishes with that lovely phrase, whose service is perfect freedom. 
you'll never be free until you're led by the Spirit. And if you get me wrong and say, well, Mr. Pawson has said that being a Christian is not a matter of rules and regulations and he's not going to make us all stop doing this on Sunday or sign the pledge or anything else. Therefore, I can do what I like on Sundays. I can go around the pubs. I can do this, that and the other. This is not what I've said. I've said that's a worse kind of slavery than giving you a set of rules, but neither is Christian liberty. According to the charter of Christian liberty, what I say is this. You are free to do everything the Holy Spirit leads you to do on Sunday. You are free to have exactly the attitude to drink and anything else that the Holy Spirit leads you to have. That's freedom. And that's perfect freedom because at last you're free from yourself and you're free for God. Now my closing word is this because there's one more sentence I haven't talked about. Is it an open option to a Christian to decide whether to walk according to the flesh or the spirit? Am I free to go out of this service as a Christian man and say, well now, what shall I do? Shall I walk according to the flesh or the spirit today? I don't know if you used to like the William books by Richmore Crompton. I loved those books when I was a boy. And uh, obviously many of you have. Well, let, I wonder if you've read the chapter, William Gets Converted. One day at Sunday school, a lady with cherries in her hat makes an impassioned appeal to the boys to be converted. And William thinks, it's come the great moment of my life, I'm going to be converted. And he goes home thinking about this, and then he decides that he would like one more day for his old nature. And that on the Monday night, he'll go around and see that lady and tell her he's going to be converted. So he wakes up on the Monday and he has a lovely feeling. It's a lovely day. Why is it such a lovely day? Oh, I know. I'm going to do all the naughty things I've ever wanted to do today. I've got to pack them into 24 hours. And then after that, I'm going to live a good and... Oh, he was quite excited at the prospect of being a saint on the Tuesday. But the Monday he got up, he locked the cook in the pantry, smashed the greenhouse windows and off he goes. And he has a wonderful day walking according to the flesh. He comes back at night, tired and happy. He turns into the road. There's a policeman turning in at his gate. There's a neighbor turning in. The gardener's going in, and he knows that he's going to face it all. After a painful interview with his father, he goes to bed, and he lies there. And he thinks, well, dear me, it's not such fun after all. I must go and see that lady. And then he suddenly remembers something naughty that he longed to do and that he hadn't done. And then he remembered something else. And something else. And as he lies in bed, he decides to make it the Wednesday. Do you know, it's one of the, the most true stories in, that, in those William books about human nature that you could ever read. Here he is. Through this Sunday school teacher, this speaker, the spirit has pulled him that way. The flesh has pulled him the other way and he's made his decision. I often wonder if Richmond Crompton was touched by the Spirit at some point to write that story, to understand that reaction, or whether she knew a little boy who did that. It's so true. But I'm speaking to adults this morning, and my message particularly this morning has been to Christians. If you're not a Christian, you don't even know this conflict. I'm speaking to those whom the Spirit is pulling one way and the flesh another. May I say that when you became a Christian, you already decided which way you were going to go. It's not an open option to go out after this service and decide whether you'll spend this Sunday in the flesh or in the spirit. It's not an open option. Because when you came to Christ and to the cross, what did you do with your flesh? You crucified it. Paul says everyone who belongs to Christ made a decision when they came to Christ that their old nature was not going to lead them anymore. And using very picturesque language, Paul says, literally, when you were converted, when you belonged to Christ, when you became a Christian, you said, I crucify my flesh with all its pull, with all its passions, with all its desires, I crucify it. And what does he mean? He doesn't mean that it's dead. Because crucifixion doesn't kill. A person can be on a cross for up to six, seven days. Jesus was six hours. Crucifixion puts a person in a place where they will die if they are left there. That's what crucifixion means. 
And when a man was crucified, he was nailed to the cross and he was left there till he died. Sometimes, maybe through a plea to the governor or somebody, sometimes he was taken down and allowed to live. But if he was left where he was put at the point of crucifixion, he would ultimately die. And what you did when you were converted was to say, Lord, here's my old nature, my flesh. I put it on the cross where Christ was nailed for me. I nail my old nature to that cross and I'm going to leave it there till it's dead. But your old nature hanging there crucified keeps pleading, take me off the cross for a little while. Just take me off again. And alas, whenever we walk after the flesh, we're taking the flesh off the cross again. And we're saying, all right, you can have a respite. You can lead me for a bit again. That's a dangerous thing to do. Those who belong to Christ, when they came to Christ, said, I do not want to be a slave of self. You said that when you were converted, didn't you? You said to Christ, I've made a mess of my life. I can't lead myself. You must lead me. And you meant it. You crucified your flesh with its passions and desires. Then I plead with you at the end of this sermon, leave it there. Leave your flesh on the cross. Leave your old nature there until it dies. But leave it there. Don't take it down again and play with it. Because that's the way it will lead you. And sooner or later it will put you back under the law from which you were set free by Jesus Christ. But isn't it wonderful that we can be free? that you can crucify your old nature and leave it there to die and be led by the Spirit and walk after the Spirit and without the effort of trying to be patient, trying to be kind, find that the fruit grows because you're walking in the right way and that the fruit tree produces the character of Jesus Christ in you because love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, there can be no doubt who sat in the studio of Paul's imagination when he painted that picture of perfect character. It's a portrait of Jesus. And what he's saying is that if you're led by the Spirit, the love of Jesus fills your heart and you become like him. Next Sunday morning we'll go further with this same passage.